All right. Tatalafkim yuma kalati wama. Good day, friends and family. Uh, welcome to our sixth and final listening session um, here at Native Americans in Philanthropy. And we're, we're pleased to save the, the, uh, be the best for last. We have Region 3, um, which covers the Southwest, Oklahoma, um, and uh, Kansas, Colorado, and Utah. And uh, we wanted to, to um, thank our host tribe, um, Pueblo Vesleta, um, for hosting us today. Um, thank you so much uh, for helping craft this agenda and get our esteemed panel of tribal leaders here for the uh, discussion we're going to have later on. Um, wanted to start this meeting off in a good way and uh, give the floor to Governor Abuela uh, from Pueblo of Isleta to provide us with an opening welcome and prayer. Governor Abuela. Good morning, everybody. เมื่อนี้ก็ยังก็วันนี้ก็ยังเป็นเอาหมดเจอเป็นเอาเวทเจอเฮียอยู่ที่เดี๋ยววันนี้ไหนที่ว่าวันไม่ไหนกูวันไ
Solutions Initiative. Uh, Greg and his team here has been doing an amazing job of facilitating these listening sessions because we did not want to build this without knowing how our tribes wanted us to build this. And each of these has been bringing together our nonprofits, our tribal leaders, our staff to listen to you about uh, your relationship with philanthropy, what you want from philanthropy. And our uh, hope is to really build and shape this platform based on everything we've been hearing from all of you. So we really appreciate your time because this is informing some deep and committed work on our part. We are here to, to make this a sustainable and long-term place for tribes to come and and access more resources. And so I'm really excited about everything we've been learning. Uh, these discussions have been really rich. And uh, I, I know that our team is going to be sharing a little bit more about how we're going to be reporting back. But just wanted to extend my welcome to all of you and really appreciate it. Looking forward to the conversation today. Back to you, Joel. Thanks, Eric. <clears throat> And uh, to talk a little bit more about uh, the, the listening sessions and the Tribal Nations Initiative and this um, year-long work that Eric just mentioned, uh, I'd like to, to pass it off to Greg Mastin, who's the Vice President of Tribal Engagements and Special Projects at Native Americans and Philanthropy. Greg. Thank you, Joel. Um, I equate to all of our friends and relatives out there, and we're so glad that you could share this time with us today. And as our uh, CEO Eric Stegman just mentioned, this is really about trying to um, better connect the philanthropy sector to the needs and priorities and what I would call true partnerships with our tribal nations. Um, philanthropy hasn't done a good job at engaging our tribal nations. Um, and so this is this is the whole purpose and intent of this is to hear from you all, to hear from our panelists on what are the needs and priorities of their communities and where they feel like um, philanthropy could uh, could best partner. And by joining us today virtually, you all will have the same opportunity to give your input about your community and your projects. And so we're going to release a survey right now. And um, I really, really strongly encourage you all to fill out this survey so that we can know about your specific community. Um, and that way we can better advocate for where um, philanthropic investments um, should go. For those of you that are not aware, out of the over $400 billion that went out last year through philanthropy, less than one half of 1% of that went to our uh, native peoples. So that means there's a huge gap, but also a huge opportunity um, to really um, look at new and creative ways to support um, the programs and the initiatives of our communities. So um, if you fill out the survey, um, that will really help us to better frame the best way to invest into our community. So, um, and we'll, we also, we also uh, we're not above uh, bribery. So uh, we have a drawing as well. Um, and for those of you that fill out the survey, uh, your name will be entered into the drawing and you'll be able to um, have a chance at winning a gift card. Um, and this survey, um, just one quick clarification. This is if you uh, are a member of a tribe or you work for a tribe um, or your community member within a tribal community. Um, if you're from a foundation, um, you know, we, we're glad that you're here to, uh, to spend this time with us and welcome, um, but you don't need to fill out this particular survey. This is for uh, people that live within a tribal community and can speak to the needs. So um, there's going to be a lot of great information. Looking forward to um, hearing from our panelists today. So I'm not going to take any more time away from them. And just thank you and uh, welcome. And uh, back to you, Joel. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, appreciate that. And <clears throat> this is uh, this is uh, a been a year long process of reaching out to to Indian country and uh, to finding out um, the needs and priorities of individual tribal communities, um, the, uh, the 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 urban Indian communities, Native Hawaiian communities, and understanding um, where um, where the engagement has been and what barriers, uh, if any, there have been for tribes to start engaging with philanthropy and foundations. And it's been enlightening, um, it truly has. And that survey has been key um, the, to, to understanding where, where um, the, the, the answers to those questions. And we're going to be releasing a report uh, in, the, in the, the springtime to early summertime that'll outline the findings from these listening sessions and really provide a guiding document that'll help inform 
not not just philanthropy and uh, and the priorities and needs and stories from our tribal communities, but also inform our our tribal leadership and tribal communities on how we can the pathways to engage with these foundations in the philanthrop philanthropic sector. So it's really important that that we um, you we get as many people to fill out that survey as possible. So appreciate you um, clicking on that link and filling out that survey, um, and. Uh, we, we have an esteemed panel of tribal leaders and um, nonprofit leaders here with us today to um, engage in that discussion and, and start in, uh, in, inspiring some, some thoughts um, so that we can really dig down and get to the, the meat of those questions to find out how, how tribes um, can get access to these significant resources that are at these uh, foundations. I mean, it just blew my mind to hear that stat that Greg mentioned when I first got into philanthropy a little over a year ago of the, of the $400 billion that's, that's given out annually and that the, the, uh, the, tribe, the tribal communities and, um, uh, and, and, and urban Indian communities access to that, those resources has been very, very minimal, less than a half a percent. And so there's a tremendous opportunity to shift more resources to tribes. We just want to do it in the right way that's directed and guided and led by tribes and tribal communities. So that's why we have you here today. And thank you so much for being here today. Um, we have uh, our host tribe, Governor Abuela from Pueblo Visleta. Um, I'd like to, to uh, pass the floor to you, Governor. Uh, if you could introduce yourself a little bit more about yourself and your community, um, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you, Joel. I appreciate it. Again, my name is Vernon Abeda. I'm the governor for the Pueblo of Isleta. Um, just a little introduction. This is my first year um, as, as a governor for the Pueblo. Um, my first year as being a leader for my Pueblo, and um, quite honestly, I've enjoyed it this far. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't make it into um, the next round of, of uh a term. So um, our terms are normally two years, and um, I did. I have enjoyed, you know, doing this so far. My background um, and what I did before this is uh, emergency medical services and uh, emergency management. And so, you know, knowing what um, emergency management is about, and coming in the middle of uh, coming into this term as governor, as middle in, in the middle of the pandemic, uh, definitely helped out um, with um, getting things straight for our pueblo and making sure that we have the right resources and things um, to make sure that we keep ourselves safe and make sure that the people are safe and that we take care of um, the people. So, you know, our focus, my focus has always been about um, caring and taking, taking care of people, kind of what my background is and, and what I do. Um, and so that's a little bit about me. I thank you, appreciate it. Katsia, uh, Governor Abuela, thank, thank you for joining us today and thank you for hosting um, this listening session. Um, Next, we have uh, President uh, Jonathan Nez from the Navajo Nation. Uh, good morning, Tatsmewi, uh, President Nez. It's good to see you again. And uh, we just, as, as uh, Eric and Greg mentioned, we, we were fortunate enough to, to see you in person uh, just last week uh, down, in, down in the Phoenix area. So it's good to see you again. And if you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about you and, and your community that you represent. Well, good morning, or good afternoon, Joel and uh, Eric and Greg and your staff. Uh, it was good to meet everyone uh, last week there in uh, Phoenix. Uh, I'm the Navajo Nation president, uh, 27,000 square miles uh, of land in four states, um, over uh, a vast uh, area of land. Uh, in, you know, when it comes to philanthropy and governments, uh, you know, there is, uh, as being the biggest tribe, there's, there's much interaction. But as uh, Greg was mentioning earlier, I don't think there, even for the Navajo Nation, much um, support is is coming to any country including Navajo Nation so uh, I know it it increased during the um, pandemic or during the time uh, we were hit hard here on the Navajo Nation you know we had groups like um, CORE and World Central Kitchen 
Kellogg Foundation, and many, many others that, that came to our aid. And now that the virus is, is lessening, you know, the philanthropy uh, and uh, giving dollars are, are uh, not there as much as it was a year ago. So we're looking forward to tapping into uh, other resources uh, to support and maybe even our own Navajo people giving back too as well, right? And that's, uh, I think, a big goal of all tribes. You know, some of our tribal members are doing very well uh, uh, and it's time to uh, challenge them to give back to their communities as well. Katsiayo, thank you, President Nez, for joining us today. Um, really look forward to the discussion later on. Uh, our next panelist we have is Principal Chief Jeffrey Standing Bear from the Osage Nation. Uh, welcome, good day, uh, thank you for joining us. If you could uh, provide a little bit more introduction about yourself and the, the nation you represent. Uh, thank you uh, and uh, greetings everyone. I'm joined by Van Big Horse here, um, who's secretary of our language, culture and education. And uh, we have not participated before in this initiative, and we appreciate the opportunity to uh, tell a little bit about us and to learn from everyone else. And we have learned ourselves that uh, we need to put all these efforts into one place Otherwise, people would be going to different members of our legislature, to my office, it's all over the place. So we've created the Osage Foundation, which has a website, and uh, we can get donations through there. It's, uh, it's, it's a nonprofit, and they can earmark the donors, uh, earmark to our different programs, like our language program or or immersion school or museum or so and so on. And Van can talk in detail about what we do at these programs. And we have uh, uh, casinos, but they're not as large as a lot of tribes. So we use all our monies, uh, all of it. Um, we try to save a little bit, but there's not much. And we uh, would appreciate uh, donations to primarily our language program, which we think is the number one issue here um, to keep that and, and embedded within it is our culture, just like all of you. And we are uh, in a hurry to, to get that work done. So uh, then everything else we think kind of falls in place after that. So we, uh, we have that foundation and they don't receive big money, but they do sponsor artists and the like, but we have, um, we have those needs. And we're one of 39 tribes in Oklahoma and uh, very diverse, very diverse needs. And uh, each one can tell you, uh, tell all of us you know, what they're thinking. So thank you. For the opportunity. Got the eye up, Principal Chief. Um, thank you. Thank you for being here today um, and, and look forward to, to understanding a little bit more about um, the Osage Foundation and the work you're doing back home. Um, the, the final panelist we have is uh, Monica Nuvamsa, and she's the Executive Director at the Hopi Foundation. Uh, welcome, Monica. Good to see you again. I uh, got to see you in person last week in, in Phoenix. Uh, at Gila River as well, so great to see you. And uh, if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself uh, and the Hopi Foundation. All right. Nekwan tawa na safti na bikas hay ni mian matsiwa na sangu pangaksino. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Monica Navamsa. I'm also Bearstrap woman in my language. I'm a member of the Hopi tribe. I'm also um, have relatives in Akoma and Habasupai, uh, and my clan is Tewa descent. 
Um, happy to be here with all of you. I represent the Hopi Foundation as the executive director. We are a 35-year-old nonprofit and foundation based on the Hopi Reservation. We're considered a hybrid organization, which is pretty rare in the philanthropic sector. Um, we both serve as a grant maker and a host of nonprofit programming in our community. Katsiaya, Monica, <clears throat> thank you for joining us today. Um, and uh, just a little bit about myself before we um, dive into the questions. Uh, I'm a citizen of the Nez Perce tribe uh, from, from Idaho. Um, I served on my tribal council uh, for eight years prior to uh, joining um, an intertribal organization here in the Northwest, AT&I, where I focused on natural resource policy work. And, uh, and now I've been uh, uh, with the Native Americans and Philanthropy team for just over a year um, as the Director of Environmental and Special Projects. And uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, help facilitate these listening sessions um, throughout this year um, that cover more than just my focus area of environment and conservation. It covers the whole gamut of what all of our people are, are facing, um, what we're trying to restore, um, and going back to um, our way of life uh, and what, what our needs and priorities are to sustain that going forward. So thank you so much for joining us here today for this discussion. And I'll start off the conversation um, with our host, with Governor Abueda. Um, can you share a little bit more about the Pueblo of Isleta and what are the top needs and priorities uh, in your community? And how are, how are your programs funded? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, the Pueblo of Isleta, just kind of give a demographic, we're um, south of Albuquerque, about 15 miles, um, and we kind of nestled in between um, Los Lunas and Busky Farms, which is kind of just a rural area. Um, we've got a lot of farmland, um, and that's kind of where, where we're at um, within our community. Um, some of the top needs that we that we look at when we're, when we're um, kind of decide when I was you know trying to figure out what are our top, top needs for the Pueblo and, and I think some of our top needs are you know stuff um, programs for children programs for kids um, to make sure that you know they have um, different things that they can do um, so they don't get caught up in stuff like uh, drugs alcohol um, all that other you know stuff that we always we don't want our kids to be a part of and then somehow end up wind up in the behavioral health system um, and needing needing those types of services. One of the biggest needs we do have, though, uh, that we do need that we do have our um, issues within our behavior, not issues within our behavior, but but needing behavioral health services um, because you know with the pandemic we did have a lot of um, children, a lot of kids, even adults that have some some depression, and so there are some issues with behavioral health that we have identified within our community, um, social services. Um, are some of the other things that we we're, we're looking at are some of our biggest needs where we need some support within that um, within that sector. Um, the other thing is um, our language and, and our language is, is paramount because without our language, um, our customs and traditions don't um, don't move forward. They, they, we won't be able to pass those on. So our language is definitely paramount. And those are some of the things that are um, a priority for us. And we need to continue to find different ways to make sure that we're able to um, continue our language. One of the biggest things that we're looking at is um, doing a total immersion type school um, to see if we can kind of do that. I know that other pueblos and tribes um, are um, have you know written languages or they're in the process of doing written languages, but we're we're looking at we're we're also looking at that as well. However, um, trying to develop an alphabet and trying to teach the older generation an alphabet and teach writing. That's going to take some time. Um, however, I think if we do the total immersion and, and kind of how I mentioned in a meeting that we had a, a, the last week, that that's how we learned as Native Americans. We were totally immersed in our own language. We spoke it every day. We um, exchanged words every day. And that's how we learned. And that's how I learned um, by being totally immersed in it, not for an hour or so within the classroom, but I'm talking anywhere from four to six hours within the classroom. And that's kind of where uh, our focus is going and, and our needs are um, within the language programs. Um, the other thing, incorporating these language programs with other 
um, programs that are out there. Like um, I know we have a couple of nonprofit organizations that are working with the Pueblo for food sovereignty and, and stuff like that. So incorporating the language within um, those types of programs that we do have within the Pueblo um, would definitely help out. And I think that's where um, we would be able to get our, our language going and then having it a part of all these different um, services within our behavioral health services and our social services program. We even changed the name of our behavioral health services so kids can, not, not necessarily kids, but um, tribal members can go and um, receive help without that stigma. So we changed our behavioral health name to Ank Uli, which means the good road. So when we go and look for the good road, that's where we go and that's where um, we want our tribal members to feel comfortable and to receive those services through behavioral health services. So it's just a little bit of our Pueblo and a little bit of our needs that we have within our community. And hopefully we'll be able to get some of this stuff funded. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our funding is uh, state and federal um, funded. Um, and then we also have um, Pueblo funded programs, which um, is uh, funded by our casino. We do have a casino, but um, you know, sometimes everybody, what we hear out in the community is, well, we have a casino, we can do all this, all this stuff. But right now, you know, there are some things that you know, we, we can't use casino funding for. Um, and so we gotta be careful when we start doing that because we don't wanna violate any type of our gaming compacts within New Mexico. So those are some of the things that we gotta be cautious of when we, when we start using these types of fundings. We got to make sure that you know we're we're following the rules as well when we when we fund different things. So we do have a funding source that helps some of our programs, um, and that is the casino. Again, however, we still have state and federal funding that we um, re rely on to provide some of these services. Thank you, Gatilio, Governor. Um, appreciate that, um, and I, I think uh, the tribes when we're going across the country. We're very familiar with that, the federal granting system, um, the 630A, the, the, tr the trust treaty relationship we have with the federal government um, and some of those um, uh, relationships we have with state and local governments as well, um, some of the pass through dollars. Um, but this is the, we're, when we're looking at the, the philanthropy in this private funding sector, it's a whole new world. And so I really ap appreciate you, you telling your perspective of, of the Pueblo of Isleta and, and, how, and how you fund your programs and trying to lift up your youth and bring back your language and, and protect your culture and your ceremonies. But so it also finds out, we can also identify gaps in how philanthropy can come in and help lift up those because <clears throat> we've, you know, the, we, we've heard this story before from other tribes that the, the federal government the, does not um, fund fully fund their obligations, their responsibilities, their promises to to tribal nations. So, thank you for that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, next, we have uh, President uh, Nez from Navajo. Um, can, can you share a little bit more about uh, the Navajo Nation and um, what are your top needs and priorities um, in your community? And explain also um, how how you, how do you fund your programs back home? All right. Thanks, Joel. Let me start with uh, how we um, fund uh, our public services. Uh, as Governor Abeda mentioned, um, 638's federal funding passed through uh, funding from the state um, and state direct uh, dollars. But for us, I mentioned 27,000 square miles. You know, we uh, have uh, natural resources uh, and those royalties come into the Navajo Nation and we're able to utilize that uh, for the needs of the Navajo people. Uh, as large as we are, uh, I know with the closure of uh, the coal-fired power plant in Page, Arizona and the closure of Peabody, and I'm sure um, uh, Monica uh, knows as well is that it, it hurt both nations, the Hopi Nation and the Navajo Nation. Um, but we were able here on Navajo, we were able to use our general fund dollars to continue that same level of public services uh, to our Navajo people. Now, let me just mention my wife, Ophelia, the first lady of the Navajo Nation has been really uh, a key to leveraging dollars that public private partnership uh, approach, you know, uh, she has founded a 
uh, Community Development Corporation uh, in our community of Shanto, Arizona. We got a hotel going up. We built a, uh, um, a convenience store uh, as well, gas station. And so she's been working with uh, other organizations out there. Uh, but one, and I applaud the Hopi Nation for having their own uh, Hopi Foundation. Uh, at one point, I see maybe the Navajo Nation would, would do something similar. Um, one of the things uh, that we did a couple of weeks ago was we were invited to the White House for the state dinner, uh, Biden and, and Harris, uh, and welcoming the French president. And we were able to be a part of the Kennedy Center uh, Honors Weekend. And the reason why I bring that up is we were rubbing shoulders with some people with lots of money, you know, two res kids hanging out with the heavy hitters out there and they have money. They have dollars that are, they have, they're able to utilize for other organizations. And they were so uh, interested in learning about uh, indigenous peoples. And I think we're the only uh, natives there at, at that function, but we, in turn, educated uh, many of these uh, wealthy individuals. And I think with the network that my wife has, and as we're transitioning out of uh, public office, you know, I think there's an opportunity here to bring some of those uh, dollars uh, that um, uh, industry corporations and wealthy individuals uh, can share with uh, indigenous communities. And I think there's an opportunity uh, for the uh, Native Americans for philanthropy as well to, um, you know, connect with some of those individuals, uh, corporations. Uh, I know here on Navajo, we have uh, enterprises and corporations that do bring in dollars back to the Navajo Nation, but it goes back into the general fund and the general fund, you know, the, the leadership uses to address the, the dwindling uh, funding for public services. But there's an emphasis, as the governor mentioned, the emphasis for us here on Navajo is infrastructure. Uh, I've been pounding on that over the years of the pandemic. 30 to 40 percent of the Navajo people don't have electricity or running water. Um, I think if you can bring infrastructure into tribal communities. You know, people will have pride in who they are even more and jobs will be created. And there you have economic and community development into the future. You see that happening in countries on the other side of the world. They put uh, a large amount of funding into infrastructure, maybe 30, 50 years ago. And today they are booming as a uh, strong economy. And I think that can happen in Indian country as well. And the other thing too, and I'll, I'll end with this, is that these individuals that we were rubbing shoulders with actually have influence with congressional leaders as well. So when we educate them, they in turn can assist in helping tribes in changing policy, regulations, and even laws, because that's who, I hate to say, that's who Congress listens to, right? Those uh, people that fund their campaigns. And here's an opportunity, and I think I challenge uh, in AP to do the same thing, is that you know these individuals that are um, you know, providing funding to organizations, we also need to let them know that there are bigger needs uh, for Indian tribes, including changing laws uh, in throughout uh, the country for better access to tribal communities, infrastructure development. That's yeah, yeah, President Nez. And um, that, that's an important point um, that I want to just uh, um, highlight that this this is a imbalance of, of power um you know the, this this power dynamic between those those um 
uh, either businesses or foundations, philanthropy with, with the resources, with the money who are influencing not just uh, investment in communities and, and what, what, um, what priorities and initiatives are tackled on our lands and with our people, um, but they're also influencing policy, influencing um, decision making at the, at the in DC and at the state at the state level as well. So it's important to when we're talking about shifting resources to more resources to tribal communities from philanthropy, we're also looking at shifting the power to to tribal communities as well. Um, looking at the leadership that we have always had and, and the stewardship we have always had over our own lands and resources, taking that perspective to um, to the people uh, who, who are in power in Washington, D.C. and in our state houses. So thank you for highlighting that. And um, N Native Americans in Philanthropy is looking at the crossover and the um, connections between the, the resources and also the, the policy and decision making um, from our leadership across the country. Um, next, I'd like to um, bring Principal Chief Standing Bear uh, into the discussion and, and ask you the same question. Uh, can you share a little bit more about the Osage Nation and what are the your top needs and priorities and how are your programs funded back home? Okay, thank you. Um, we were fortunate to be ready for the uh, CARES Act money and later the ARPA funds as we've been pushing for food sovereignty and self-sufficiency. Uh, and then in March of 2020, there was just no meat here at all in this area. And we were able to, within eight months, to put up with those funds a meat processing plant and some greenhouses, and they're functioning very well. And it attracted a lot of tribal members that know a lot about that area. And they came back home and they're working now with our cattle and bison herds. And that's, that was really, and still is, a great thing. And then as we went along, we went ahead with infrastructure. Um, as the uh, chairman said, uh, the president, sorry, old days. The uh, president said they uh, uh, got to have infrastructure, and so do we. And so we ha still have water problems, and we're working on them, though. And lately, we, we've received a lot of funding for us at least for internet and that's great stuff and we we work on that all the time so these are big projects uh the needs of the communities for water sewer um internet but where we uh need to go is uh as the uh, uh governor said uh our number one priority outside of our language is the mental health, the depression, the anxiety, all those issues which, uh, which plague us. And it goes along too with the uh, sugar-based diseases and of uh, alcoholism and uh, diabetes. Diabetes really tears us up and alcoholism is still you know, what it is. And but you know we got to get control of that depression and show support. But as we all know, uh, there's only so much you can do as a loving father, mother, aunt, uncle, child, uh, nephew. There's only so much you can do because a lot of these issues are so complex and deep. You got to have professionals. So we we are concentrating on on this and then finding uh, bed space so we don't have to send our people to different states and all that. But again, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to Van because Van Big Horse, just for the rest of our statements, um, we, we need to be creative, which we are in technology and language, but we need funding that's flexible, more flexible, uh, and this philanthropy money can do that. And I think if you allow this for a minute, uh, Van Bighorse is here. It's all right if he just says a few words. Yes, yes, go ahead, Van. Thank, thank you, uh, Chief Standing Bear. All right, thank you, Chief. <clears throat> yeah, as, as uh, Chief was saying, uh, you know, uh, his platform is 
culture, language, and our children enrichment, you know, education, as I've been hearing from uh, everyone here this afternoon. And, um, um, you know, before the pandemic actually hit, we were pretty much 90% funded by the Osage Nation here. And uh, we have, you know, we had an A&A grant at one time, but uh, we really wasn't um, focusing on grants. Um, you know, I, I think it kind of goes back to sovereignty, you know, we were just trying not to, we were just trying to use our own, our, you know, tell our people how to govern ourselves. But um, as we started getting into um, the uh, pandemic and like Chief was saying, the, um, you know, as we all know, uh, everything kind of went to a digital, for, uh, digital format, format. And so we were having difficulties reaching out to our people as all of us do here, you know, Wi-Fi, internet, even uh, folks having their own computer systems, telephones, all these things that we need to reach out to our people because we couldn't meet in person um, to be able to teach our classes in person. And while we're all sitting home, you know, as, as we all had to at one point, you know, it all gets back to, as, as we are saying about health, you know, keeping our you know, keeping ourselves healthy in our minds, you know, and being able to, um, uh, you know, to be able to to keep our our minds uh, in a positive thought. And and Chief said, you know, uh, the language department is going to be one of our essential programs. So we were having classes on Zoom the best that we knew how. You know, it was all new to us trying to reach out to our people. And so we learned quite a bit there that, um, okay, uh, so we had, you know, we're, we're not a big tribe. We have maybe 20 some thousand and we had a couple of thousand getting on there, uh, looking at our lessons and, and learning, you know, and that's, that was big for us, you know, for them to be able to, to that, that many people. So, uh, so we started thinking further along the line and we started using you know, uh, language applications from various uh, companies that helped us make some, did you know, language apps and those types of things. And and I was glad to hear that there's other tribes that are working on their own orthography. We have our own orthography now, and uh, so we're we're trying to um, you know build our um, curriculum with our you know with our orthography and and getting all these things out there. But it's very costly, very costly. And we used every ARPA CARES dollar that we could use, and we stretched it as far as we could, as far as we could. And so, like I would always tell Chief, you know, over here with us, you know, I said this is the last train out. We don't really have a lot of elders left in our tribe, you know, and we got to we got to use them, use their minds, and use our ways to be able to continue our uh, effort in language revitalization. And uh, and uh, continue to uh, to uh, sustain our culture. That's who we are as people. And we always say that if we don't have a language and a culture and a land, uh, and a land base, how is the government going to look at us? So those are very important to us. And um, so it, it's going. It, it costs. It's very costly. And uh, you know, and our our tribal dollars only spread so far. And I'm here to learn, you know, uh, this this new this new road here, philanthropy. And we 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 happen to have, like Chief said, we have a 501c3. We have we, we we've got that in place. So um, uh, it's good to hear that you know the, uh, there's you know we, we're people that are able to get out and reach uh, these people up in D.C. that that are lobbyists and are are. Um, you know, are powerful people that have money that influence our, our our congressmen and people like that that can help change policies and do the things to help our people. And so we're we're, we're trying our best here at the Osage Nation to to have these. And I, I'd like to have a um, a master pr apprentice program for our teachers to be able to continue our effort working with our early childhood development, our, our young people, our little kids from you know, from a month or two old up to the 12th grade. 
That's what I said. That's what we see. And I'd add that uh, we've come so far with this every dime we can find. And we have such dreams in the future. But now in the last eight years since we've been working like this, um, now the little children are, are saying prayers at all the Thanksgiving dinners and different, even the funeral dinners I've seen them. They're getting up and being asked to say the prayers in our language and they, they do it and they do it with confidence. And I've seen that, uh, I've seen our people uh, go to tears on this just because that's what it takes. But it costs money and, and we need more money that's flexible to, to keep us here. And like this man said at the Pueblo to me eight years ago when I first got into this business here, he said, uh, this Pueblo man said, we've been here thousands of years and we're not going to lose this language on my watch. And, and, and he, he inspired me, that governor of that Pueblo. So uh, that's where we're coming from anyway. So thank you. That's yeah, yeah, uh, Chief Standing Bear and, and Mr. Big Horse. Uh, you know, the, that we've been hearing um, that from a lot of tribes throughout our listening series um, and the focus on bringing back your language, bringing back your culture, restoring land. You know, what you talked about, about carrying on our, our way of life to the future generations really requires those connections um, to our land, to our waters, to our, to our languages and our ceremonies. So I think that that has been one of the top priorities that has really um, bubbled up to the top. Um, and I just wanted to um, um, remind everybody that we do have the survey link in the chat. So all those who are um, uh, with us here today who are a member of a tribe, who are a leader from a tribe, who work for a tribe, who live in the tribal communities or in our urban Indian communities, um, please fill out the survey so we can, we can really um, answer those questions about what are the priorities and needs uh, of, the, of your particular tribal community and how philanthropy can uh, partner and invest in, in those initiatives that are truly tribally driven. Um, and like I said, one, one that has really risen to the top is pr protecting, restoring our culture, restoring land, um, and reconnection with our ceremonies and our ways of life. Um, so appreciate everybody for filling out that survey. And, and just as a little incentive, we're going to have a $100 gift card um, uh, that we'll be drawing for folks who fill out the survey. Um, uh, next question, I'd like to bring um, back uh, President Nez. Um, uh, you talked about um, tribes relying on federal um, and or other tribal funds to support uh, your, your key services and programs for your communities. Um, does philanthropy play a role in supporting your tribal nations programs and initiatives? And um, what priorities would you want those foundations to fund? That's, that's a good question, Joel. Um, we have uh, many organizations here on the Navajo Nation and uh, raise money on behalf of helping the Navajo people. And so sometimes uh, you don't know what they're doing, right? Because they're in a separate organization. And I, I think at times uh, we wonder uh, what type of uh, strings are attached with those fundings. Of course, with federal dollars, you got, you got to jump through so many hoops uh, before you can be able to use it. It's, it's got to be used for a, a specific purpose. But when it comes to um, dollars from uh, organizations, you know, it's a little flexible, but at, at the same time, you know, we, we don't know um, how those dollars are to be utilized, especially if they're um, doing work here on the Navajo Nation. And so we've been moving towards uh, some type of accountability measure just because of how large we are, you know, we, we can't keep track of every uh, outside money that's coming in. Um, I'm, I'm, don't get me wrong. I mean, all they're doing, I'm sure they're doing some great work, but uh, that's another thing that I'm sure we all recognize 
guys that we got to, uh, you know, be careful of, um, you know, or organizations out there coming into tribes, raising money on, on their behalf. And, and sometimes little to none of that dollar goes to the intended purposes. But I think tribes being a sovereign nation have the ability to hold organizations accountable um, by developing laws, uh, regulations. And now let me just say too that, you know, with uh, these, these organizations that we know of uh, are, are doing great work. Like for instance, um, CORE came, is here, uh, World Central Kitchen uh, was here. You know, these are large organization, Kellogg Foundation, large organization. So they have a track record. And with that track record, you know, we, we know that the dollars that are coming into the Navajo Nation is going to be used uh, uh, for what the tribe wants to use it for. Uh, for instance, uh, I always go back to the uh, pandemic, you know, all funding came in for PPEs, masks, hand sanitizers, uh, food, and supplies. And a lot of that came into our Navajo Nation, to our Navajo people in times of need, which was great. And we acknowledged uh, the great work uh, that these organizations have done. Um, at the same time, I think uh, we saw other organizations uh, do similar in other communities of color as well. And so we just got to stay cognizant of uh, these organizations with a, with a good track record. And, uh, you know, we just got to be uh, well aware of what they are, are, are doing in our communities. So I thought I'd share that, something different, because I see some tribal leaders that are uh, on, on the call too today. Um, and on the web, uh, I saw introductions happening on the chat. So I appreciate that, that question. Thanks, Joel. Katsiaya, President. Um, I, uh, next question, I'd, I'd like to go to um, uh, Monica Nuvamsa from the Hopi Foundation. Um, the Hopi Foundation has a, has a long history of, of working with and supporting Native peoples. Can you share a little bit more about the work and mission of the Hopi Foundation? And uh, what are some of those key points you feel philanthropy needs to know in working with nonprofit organizations that serve tribal nations? Thank you, great question. I, I think it's really important to understand how we grew as a foundation first on Hopi. Um, most foundations people know about in, in the broader mainstream sector, they tend to come from already uh, a corpus of wealth. They come from corporations like the Kellogg Foundation or um, private family foundations like Rockefeller. Those are some of the ones that folks are most interested or have more, more um, awareness of. But the Hopi Foundation is complete opposite. We, Kate, we started with a vision and no corpus. Uh, the idea was to be able to raise our own wealth and to build our own wealth based on the priorities and needs that we felt as a community were important. We also didn't want to compete with government. Uh, we knew that the federal government had its responsibilities and that we should never let them go of those responsibilities. They should always be held to account, and that's the role of our, our tribal leadership. Our tribal community uh, governments also have their role and function to support and um, benefit our communities as well. So the way that we've navigated that growth and our place within our community is to make sure that we're understanding that landscape and fitting in those gaps where we feel that um, any of those sectors are not meeting, uh, filling in the gaps where um, people aren't paying attention to or understanding or having the resources for. Um, and a lot of that, unfortunately, tends to fall in the areas of things like cultural preservation or language preservation, even education and health. 
Uh, so some of those are, are challenges. I know that all of us tribes face, and we place a lot of uh, special uh, attention to that through our programming. Uh, we do host our own Hopi Substance Abuse Prevention Center. We also have youth leadership development and adult leadership development programming to start growing that new generation of leaders. Uh, we also support um, public radio, which helps to provide communication and engagement of our local members within all of the, the different activities that happen here on the reservation. We, we span about 12 uh, villages plus one new community, and that's over a million and a half acres. It's a large area to cover, and, and we tried to meet those needs as best we could. Um, having been here in the community as an organization for 35 years, we've been seeing a growth of our nonprofit sector. I'm really um, proud of the fact that our community has embraced nonprofits as a solution to some of our community needs. We do, today, we have 19 formalized nonprofits within our Hopi community alone. That means they are either a 501c3 or a 7871. And then we have another 13 more community-based grassroots organizations that may or may not decide to go formal, but they're meeting needs in their areas of interest as well. Um, some of the learning that we've had as a, a foundation in our community, uh, things that I would say would be key um, around the, the, the conversation of philanthropy is reminding everyone that giving is about relationships and not money. Uh, it's an act that relies on our ability to demonstrate our human values, our, our cultural values, if you will, of respect and nurturing our shared vision and our love of humankind. Philanthropy is also um, required to be sustainable if, if we want change. It's necessary if we want change. So to create sustain sustainability, we have to rely on strengthening our ability to do the work ourselves and not just asking the outside in to help us with our solutions, but really building those solutions from the inside out and working with one another to find those solutions to rebuild these traditional systems that we want to preserve. Um, and to, to most importantly, rebuild our interdependence. That's what makes a strong community. This means encouraging the philanthropic sector itself to look at our relationships from a place of value and investment, because we have our own ingenuity, we have our own leadership, as well as our own infrastructure to rely on. Um, collaborations on a local level are also important uh, because we can't do it all by ourselves as a nonprofit or as a foundation. We all have a different strength within our community, uh, and that means understanding what our limitations are as sectors, whether that be government, social, or private sectors, and the unique capacities that we each carry to support our local families and economies. Every sector can learn to work together and leverage the most for our communities because we share a similar vision for our people. We also pray for the same things for our people. No matter the pipeline into our tribal communities, we all serve the benefit of our people and for the shared vision of health, well-being, prosperity, and to steward the thriving cultures of our ancestors. Um, I can share with you some of my experience with early philanthropy because I've been in this field now for 16 years formally, but I've worked with other foundations uh, on a national level. Each philanthropy, early philanthropy was limited. I can tell you that for sure, even just in the short 16 years I've been engaged, um, it was limited to who could participate and who would benefit. And at times it could be very one way directed from funder to grantee. Today, I see it's beginning to look a little different with more allies in the foundation world, working to understand how we define our needs rather than simply being prescriptive or relevant to their mission and becoming more inclusive of tribal community priorities and community-based solutions. Some are also learning to accept our ways of defining and measuring our own impact on our, on our terms and these are important when they want to become a partner towards sustainable solutions. Short-term investments, I think, are a thing of the past now. This only touches the surface and makes donors and funders feel good for a moment, but it leaves a little 
leaves little to sustain that measure generational and social generational change to social healing uh, through economic growth, if that's your, your area of interest, and environmental change. We seek long-term solutions. I think every tribal leader can agree, along with every tribally led nonprofit. Those are really important to, to us because they require building from the value of respect, um, from our values of generosity, reciprocity, and doing the work together. It, it, no matter which way you slice it, it's still hard work to do this in, in the philanthropic um, discussion. I do want to point out one last thing uh, for our tribal leaders and for Native Americans in philanthropy. If you haven't shared it yet, um, at the beginning of the conversation, there was um, sharing of how much is at stake within this philanthropic um, arena. $471 billion gets given out in the, in the philanthropic giving. Um, but where does it come from? You know, we're talking about foundations today. Less than 20% of that 400 billion comes from foundations and corporations. The largest piece of that giving, 69%, nearly 70% of that 400 billion comes from individuals, individuals who have a heart to care for something that they believe in, that, that trust your story, that want to help and, and that's why I say philanthropy is about relationships. It's about making sure that we're building that level of respect across the table. Mm -hmm. Katsia, yeah, yeah. thank you, Monica, for, for that perspective. Um, and it's something that Native Americans Philanthropy has been supporting um, for over uh, our 30 years of existence as well. Um, the, fir the first uh, in initial uh, years of, of our existence, we're focused on supporting um, our tribal members working inside the, the philanthropic sector at these foundations and lifting them up and their voices and supporting them. But it was also supporting indigenous nonprofits such as your own um, in this sector. And because you're, we're all doing great work within our communities. And I think it takes, takes all of us taking, taking these different um, tactics and, and perspectives um, from the government side to the to the nonprofit side, working with the philanthropic sector um, and taking advantage of, of the opportunities there. And it, and it also goes to um, uh, President Nez's point uh, about um, the, uh, um, the, 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 the various foundations that are in this world and the fact that, that there needs to be um, um, significant uh, research and vetting um, of, of these individuals so that we can de develop that those trust based relationships that you're talking about, so that they're long term sustainable and that we're partnering with the right folks right because because we have been exploited and burned in the past and I think getting into something like this that we don't know a lot about. We're going to have to do our homework and make sure that that we do it in the right manner, and that's where Native Americans and philanthropy steps up to the plate and provides that um, services. Um, and so, um, building upon that, um, Governor Bueda, um, the, you know, the philanthrop philanthropic sector is still new to a lot of tribes. Like, for instance, um, my tribe, the Nez Perce tribe. Uh, when I was on tribal council, I think we dealt with one one foundation on a, a land back um, deal. But other than that, we we had very few relationships in this philanthropic sector. Um, and I know we're in the same boat with a lot of other tribes who are interested but have not had that engagement yet. So can you discuss um, what you think the philanthropic sector needs to know about tribes and what areas you feel that their investments could be more impactful on in, in our tribal communities. Thank you, Joel. I, I think that uh, the we, they, they need to know about our Pueblo, what kind of services we provide and how we provide those services and who we provide them to. Um, I know just because we do have a casino doesn't mean that we always provide these services to them. And I wanna make that clear that not, just because we do have that funding source coming in, it's not always, enough to fund the services that we do need. And I, and I wanna make that you know, um, known that you know, we do have some funding available, yes, but it's not always enough to continue the services that we need. Um, we do work with, um, like I said earlier, uh, nonprofit organizations, the Center for Southwest Culture. Uh, and there's a couple of programs that work under that 
um, that assist them with their nonprofit stuff and the food sovereignty stuff. And, and I think that, you know, if we can grow that and have our uh, individuals that are under those, under that um, Centers for Selfless Culture to be able to get, you know, the, their, their 501c3 and be really fully invested within the Pueblo and, and make sure that, you know, that we give them that support um, from the Pueblo side and um, um, the, the ability to help them get funded through um, the philanthropy stuff. And then like President Nez said, you know, make sure that we do um, vet them, make sure that they are, um, you know, good companies to work with and, and stuff like that. So I think that, you know, just knowing that we are willing to do some stuff and move forward for the Pueblo and with the, with the organizations that are here within the Pueblo and the community, we're willing to do a lot of that stuff and make sure that we can do those things. Joel, I'm going to have to leave. Uh, this is Standing Bear. Uh, Van Big Horse is going to fill in for Osage. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate it. This is really you. good. Yeah, uh, congratulations on this kind of work. Thank you. Thank, thank you. It's only possible because of the support from, from tribal nations such as Osage. So thank you so much for, for being here today and, and your, your insight and your words of wisdom. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask um, Van uh, the, the final question to Osage. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, before I go to um, uh, Mr. Big Horse, uh, I, I'd like to um, ask Monica another question. Um, we know that the philanthropic investments uh, have not been equitable in supporting Native, Native American peoples. Uh, can you share some insights about what have been some of the barriers and what you think is needed to improve the true partnerships you were talking about from the philanthropic sector with our tribal communities? I think the, the short answer is it's a capacity issue from the lens that I've seen over the years is that we, we are still growing our idea of philanthropy even among tribal communities. When COVID happened, you know, it was a real eye-opener for me to see just regionally and statewide, um, the struggle it was to be able to tap into those ready resources that people were willing to give right away. But among our tribal nations in, in my region alone, not everyone had a philanthropic giving uh, organization within their community that knew the community and knew the network that they needed to talk with and, and be able to distribute the resources effectively and, and I think that capacity building in that arena is, is really critical. If we build that, we can leverage more, we can do more, and we can build more relationships. Um, so I think capacity building for me is, is one of the a more direct, easier answers. There, there are other challenges, of course, um, but as we build and learn how to engage with philanthropy, um, we'll be able to find our own solutions for that because every tribe is different. I tell funders every time, if you've met one tribe, you've met one tribe. <laughs> there's there's no size, one size fits all. We all have our own unique challenges and our, our unique strengths as well. Thank you, Monica. Um... Did, did you did you have something you wanted to to ask for the tribal leaders yeah. who are on the on the call here today? I, I would love to to have the opportunity to to share and ask. And this is not just for the tribal leaders on this call, but for those that may listen in the future. I think that native nonprofit sector is still growing across Indian country. Um, and I just want to let you know we need your support as well to expand our areas of influence. We need leader support to help advocate for access to federal funding um, that are restricted only to tribal governments so that resources can flow more easily into our communities. Remember, we all serve the same people, no matter what, at the end of the day, we're all serving the same individuals, the same households. We also need leader support to build partnerships uh, with federal agencies that are often limited in their ability to leverage on the ground impact and directed service to families and communities. Uh, that are often isolated from having a voice at the government table. It's, it's not our space, it's not our arena, but you can be an advocate for us as well. Um, think of us as an arm to, to the work that you do and the vision that you have in the community. Uh, we need collaborative planning 
and development because not every solution can be found in the halls of a legislative office. Um, they can happen in a cornfield, they can happen at a family table or among neighbors. Thank you, Monica. Uh, you know, we, we have we have extremely um, uh, motivated, talented, smart um, tribal members who are working uh, across across uh, the, the government, but also the nonprofit sector in these in these um, NGOs. And I appreciate you bringing that that point to to the discussion here today. That that we're all fight, we're all there for the same communities, um, and we're all doing good work from these different different areas of expertise that we all have. Um, and um, I, I'd like to um, go to the last question for our discussion um, to um, to Mr. Big Horse. Um, uh, and after that, if we have some time, I think there's a couple key questions from the chat that I'd also like to, to pose for our panel. Um, but Mr. Big, um, Mr. Big Horse, uh, your tribe, the Osage Nation, has a foundation that funds community projects, but also seeks funding to support some of your tribe's priorities. Can you share a little bit about the, the Osage Foundation and its priorities? And are there projects or programs that you think philanthropy could support? Yes, the, the Osage Nation Foundation um, is a, is a uh, process where we try to support our local, um, you know, like artists, uh, people that have a business plan that are, um, that are maybe, you know, starting up a, a, like a small business or something along that line. And we, you know, we, we can't really, um, we're all limited on the funding that we're able to give each person uh, with that, through that organization. And um, it's, it's been in, in place for about probably 10 years now. And they do, uh, they do good work. And um, they just do a lot of fundraisers actually to raise money for that 501c3. Um, but we are uh, a good example of what we're working on right now is uh, we're working on a museum expansion. And we're going to have to reach out to help us fund that project. So uh, we're going to use this 501c3 to be able to go out and seek you know, some funding to help us, you know, to finish, the, to finish the project. And we feel like the 501c3 is going to be the, the way to, to, to help us get that done. Uh, philanthropy, I, I, like I said, I'm uh, uh, new with this. I, I think it's a great thing. I like what Monica was saying. You know, uh, it's just not a, per, a place to go uh, seek money, but build a relationship with these with these uh, types of people, and um, and as one of the uh, one of the governors was saying earlier, you know that um, we need to um, to share our tribes, what we do, who we are, educate them, where they can pass the word on to other people. You know, four hundred billion dollars, and we only got a half a percent. You know that just doesn't seem doesn't seem right at all. You know. And we all seem to have the same, same struggles, the same, the same issues, infrastructure, uh, language, culture, education. Um, it, it, it's all around us. We all have the same issues. Broadband, Wi-Fi, uh, early childhood development for our children, you know, drugs and alcohol. You know, we all have the same thing. We all need the same thing. We all need the same needs. And even in our, our our childhood school that we have, our early childhood school, you know, um, we've we've got it, but it's, it's it takes a tremendous amount of money, as we all know, you know, millions of dollars, and we're only able to fund so much to make it work. And sustainability on these new projects that we have, we're going to have to once we get these the the, the meat processing. Uh, company going and the broadband that we got going, we, we're going to have to fund. We're going to have to uh, come up with ideas and marketing ideas on how to sustain these businesses. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Van. I appreciate that. And um, talking about su sustainability and going forward for our tribal communities. I mean, we, we, we've done so much with, with very little, as I said, you know, our federal government has it stepped up to the plate and honored their, their promises, their obligations, but we're, we're still doing this work on the ground, either it's from the tribal nation as a government or working with nonprofits like Monica's and others to get this work done on the ground for our people. And, and as um, somebody in the chat mentioned, you know, we've always been, um, uh, philanthropists. We just didn't have that word, right? We would just call this something else in our own language. We're giving, we're giving people, we're generous people. We help out our communities and those in need. And so this is nothing new to us um, as a concept, but this, this world, this philanthropic world with these foundations that have built their wealth off of our backs and others, you know, our resources, our lands, our people um that's new and so we we're starting to to change that that sector to build those trust relationships that are long term um and they understand us and our stories where we come from and then they're listening they're finally listening you know um to us and having us lead these efforts and these initiatives on the ground um mm -hmm. so thank you so much for for um for today's conversation i do have a couple two two questions i'd like to get to before I hand it over to um, Greg Mastin, our VP, um, to uh, close us out with some um, some announcements. Um, the first one goes to uh, Governor Abeda. Um, could you share uh, um, some of the organizations that you work with um, in the area of food sovereignty? As I mentioned earlier, the Centers of Southwest Culture, um, there's a couple of programs that work under that and that's um, Pueblo Resurgence. Uh, with Daryl Lucero, um, and I believe um, Janice Lucero um, with Cotton Blossom uh, is the other ones that we work with. Um, Kateri, Kateri um, Hohol is actually a part of the um, Pueblo Resurgence as well. Um, so we work with them uh, here at the Pueblo um, through um, the Center for Southwest Culture. Thank you so much, Governor. And then the next question from the chat uh, goes to President Nez. Um, so this individual says that they're um, they're starting a new fund to support a specific population of of Navajo. Um, how how can they get um, um, a list of of Navajo nonprofits, a trusted list of Navajo nonprofits to help work with? Well, our regulations here on the Navajo Nation does require your organization to register with the Navajo um, Division of Economic Development and required to do reports, but not everybody does that, right? And so I think they have to go uh, ask the Division of Economic Development for a list of nonprofits that are registered here on the Navajo Nation. Um, and also with the, the state of Arizona, we're in four states. So you would have to uh, look at um, the four states uh, as well and see who is registered. Some, some people have their name Navajo, but they don't do anything on the Navajo Nation too. So those are another things that we have to uh, um, be aware of. Thanks for that question. Back to you, Joe. Thank you, President. Appreciate that. Um, and I know there are a bunch of other um, questions in the chat and thank you for those. And we, we will answer those um, offline because um, we're getting close to the, the end of our time with you today at our listening session. Um, so I will um, pass it to Greg Mastin, who's uh, the Vice President of Tribal Engagements and Special Projects for some, some announcements and some closing words, Greg. Uh, thank you, Joel, and um, thank you to our uh, panelists today for sharing just some amazing thoughts about our our communities and um, a little bit of the history of our engagement or lack of engagement with philanthropy. And as I mentioned earlier, really, this is truly about repositioning this um, and inviting entities that are willing to work with our communities, um, but but not to to direct in any way. Uh, we're seeking true partnerships, and so I hope today. You gain some valuable information about uh, and maybe start thinking about within your organization um, about what kind of portfolio you do have that is supporting Native American peoples 
and what communities that you could uh, approach and sort of talk through what are ways that you could best partner and support them. Um, I want to thank um, Pueblo of Isleta for being our host tribe today and to Governor Abeda for just being a wonderful host throughout this whole process. And um, Governor, I hope that this was uh, enriching for you as, as well. Um, I know that in our discussions with him, he said philanthropy is new to them and they they haven't really engaged philanthropy. So, and this is exactly why we're out here um, because I believe that if these partnerships can be done in the right way, uh, we can really uh, do some good in our communities. Um, Want to thank all of the the other panelists, President Nez, for joining us today um, and thank, sharing your thoughts uh, with us. I uh, Want to thank um, Principal Chief Standing Bear of the Osage Nation and Van Big Horse for um, sharing their thoughts and also to Monica Nuvamsa from the Hopi Foundation for sharing your wisdom with us. You got a lot of shout outs in the chat there, Monica, so thank you very much. Um, and I just wanted to end this too with um, a few tangible announcements. You know, we often talk about philanthropy and what it can do. And, um, and you know, we wanna know, let you all know that we are starting to, to move that dial and to see some changes. Uh, we just recently uh, publicly announced NAP's Tribal Nations Conservation uh, Pledge and Funding Collaborative. And so this is a move at really trying to help better organize and connect um, resources that can support, support tribally led conservation. So that can include um, land back, it can include um, waterways, it can include um, uh, wildlife and habitat. Um, and as the first major act of that fund, we recently partnered with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, NIFWIF. Um, they were the organization that uh, administered the grant as part of the America the Beautiful Challenge. So they awarded out $91 million this year through that. Next year, it will be higher. So keep that, um, I believe it'll be higher anyway, keep that on your radars. Um, and we were able to, um, to partner and to advocate to try and get as many tribally led projects funded as possible. So they awarded out $26 million to tribes. So we're really thrilled about that, that the percentage was much higher than uh, they were originally um, projecting. And as part of the partnership, um, we actually, there was a non-federal match requirement within that grant as, um, as often can happen within government grants. But because of our uh, fund, we actually were able to step in and pay the, the match for all the tribal applicants that qualified for this. So we're super thankful and grateful to our partners that made that possible. Um, as another um, announcement, we recently um, entered into a new agreement uh, and an MOU with the Department of the Interior. There was a lot of discussion today about better coordination, uh, particularly, um, particularly um, when looking at our tribal nations, our nonprofit sector, um, and the government sector, and where there are a lot of crossovers. And so through this new um, MOU with the Department of the Interior, um, Native Americans and philanthropy will um, be supporting two positions that will help to coordinate these public and private partnerships and look at other opportunities where we can really leverage um, funds from the federal side, but also from the philanthropic side, and ultimately to, you know, to better support our communities. So the NIFWIF grant is an example of that, um, but it really can spill over into a lot of other areas. So, so keep your eyes open um, to that work as it um, grows and, and advances. Um, and then the third thing I want to mention, really proud of, is our Native Voices Rising partnership. Um, what's really um, amazing about this organization is it's it's run by Native people, it's led by Native people, the decisions are made by Native people, and it supports Native projects, both urban and rural, across the nation. And um, I'm happy to announce that this year we were able to help raise about $10 million for them to support Native communities across the nation. Uh, so that's a significant um, increase in what they've been able to award out in the past. So we're just so pleased to be able to partner with them and to support the many um, Native peoples uh, across the nation out there. Um, and so once again, I just want to thank you all so much for spending the time with us today. I hope that you learned a lot. I know um, in my growth in philanthropy and even, even back home, it's still new to them. And they're now um, talking about um, developing more infrastructure and capacity as, as Monica discussed earlier. Um, and so um, we're just really wanting to support 
um, all the different native peoples out there. And it is a new area. So there's still a lot of um, growth and development that needs to take place. Um, but there's also, that means there's a lot of opportunities that we can grow together and partner together. Um, I, I'm based out of the uh, Pacific Northwest and we have a, an, old, an old saying there, which is the rising tide, it lifts all of the canoes. And so by working together um, in, in including philanthropy, but also with our tribal governments, also, also with our nonprofits, it makes us all better um, as, as a people. So I thank you all for your time today. Um, before we close off, oh, and I forgot, uh, I, my apologies. I'm a, I don't think I said this earlier. I'm a, I'm a member of the Yurok tribe, I'm also descendant of the Hoopa and the Kruk people. So don't want to forget my, my home people. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And uh, Joel, I'm going to turn it back to you and let you do the final closing. Um, also, oh, one last thing. If you haven't filled out the survey, please fill out the survey. There's still time. And it is important for us to hear about your community needs. Uh, and priorities. Uh, otherwise, how can we advocate for those? So we really want to know what are the projects out there so that we can connect some of these funders to you. So back to you, Joel. Katsiayo, thank you, Greg. And all that's left to do is, uh, is say happy holidays. And thank you for joining us. The, the panel was incredible. The tribal leaders um, uh, and, and Monica, the, the discussion was, was truly inspirational. Thank you for sharing your insights and your wisdom with it, with us here today. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you for filling out the survey. Please continue to pass that on to, to any, any community members, staff members, leadership from your tribes that you, that you feel would ben, um, could, could fill this out because um, the, 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 all the information that's collected will be um, compiled in a report um, that we will uh, issue next year. Um, so that wraps up our, our listening se session for this whole year. Um, we've gone across Indian country and, and it has been extremely successful. And thank you so much for all your input, your time and your attention. And I hope you have a wonderful holiday season with your family. Stay safe, stay warm. Um, President Nez and all those others who are um, getting us getting a snow, a snowstorm. Um, please, please stay safe and warm. And until um, we meet again, yochalo. <laughs>